Hey, Shalom Saints, Shalom, Shalom, Shalom. I almost said Shabbat Shalom. i got to remember this is first day evening. We're actually coming into second day. Hallelujah. Uh, glory to the King. Hey, uh, of course, this is Elder Becker um, with tonight's uh, Blog Talk edition. Okay, let me see. Let's get back to the chat room and see how we are coming in. Always an 11 and a 10. <laughs> All right, we got it. Sounds like everybody can hear pretty good. Hallelujah. Well, hey, I hope everybody in Israel is doing well. I hope you all are truly blessed and continuing on fighting the, the good fight of faith, um, laying on a hold of eternal life, huh? And now what the Word tells us, glory to the King. Well, Brother Shane uh, just put the title in here a little while ago, um, you know, just minutes before the show started, so uh, perhaps some of you caught it, some of you didn't. And it's going to be... Um, uh, I don't know if interesting is anything more informative, I guess, because, um, you know, we are definitely been talking about, um, true, uh, true biblical marriage to marriage in the, in, in the word, in the Bible and, you know, and the things that have been repressed and, um, pretty much removed from us as a culture because, there's obviously a, an agenda that um, these type of things don't get out. Oh, yeah, Joseph's Wise, that's what it's called. Anyway, um, hey, I'm sure y'all been just feeding uh, really well. I mean, uh, uh, you know, the Most High has really blessed us, obviously, as he always does with, you know, the words of life and edification you know, when pastor's been speaking about the thoughts all week and, um, you know, the things that do with the mind, the battle that, you know, everything comes through that conduit through your mind. And it all comes through the eye things that we see, we hear, you know, we take in, we allow ourselves to, you know, be a part of. And uh, as he said, you know, yesterday, them are the things, that environment, that atmosphere that governs um, how we act. And so, I am thankful for for these messages. They're all about transformation and restoration and perfection, sanctification, and everything that's going to take for us to get to see our king and be a perfected bride without spot or blemish. Hallelujah. Well, glory to the king. Yeah, tonight's topic is Joseph's wives. And the fact of the matter is this, this is, um, it, it was probably, it, it was a very, um, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to use the word trying study, but it was a um, it was a challenge because there's so many things that are going on behind the scenes with this that it's it's nearly impossible to uh, you know you know say conclusively that it was a fact. And obviously, there's no dispute that Joseph had two wives. It's the truth. He had two wives. The question is, did he have them at the same time? And that is the that is the thing that we're going to investigate tonight. We're going to look at, um, uh, you know, I'll give you my conclusion right up front is that, no, there's no way to prove it. But what's more importantly is there's no way to disprove it. So it's an open-ended argument, I guess. Um, and there is a whole lot of, you know, there's a whole lot behind what's written because, um, well, I mean, how can I put this? There wasn't There wasn't much given about the whole context of, of Joseph and in his personal life. So, uh, you know, the, 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 the Bible is pretty limited on what it gives, but if you know how to look at it and read through the way it was written, of course, not putting any type of exegesis or eisegesis into it, just for taking it on the context of what it says, there's a lot of nuggets in there. So that's what we're going to kind of, um, look at. Yeah. Hallelujah, brother ugly. Um, No, that's good like that. Anyway, with that, we're going to get started, okay? And, um, you know, I've got this this particular study. It's going to go all two hours, but I've got a lot of, um, what do you call it, a lot of type notes. I've got a lot of reference notes I'm going to read at because there was so much that was going on in my head while I was doing this study. The only way I can do it, I, you know, honestly, keep everything there is put it on paper because, uh, you know, sometimes just get overwhelming. But... This study is going to um, basically trace the life of Joseph. We're going to go through the steps. We're going to look at different ways, different different um, views that the Bible presented, 
Um, and just you know, it, again, it's not conclusive, but it's nothing that you can say that can't be a fact. So with that, we're going to get started. Anyway, the, the title tonight is called Joseph Wives. All right. The, though the Bible never t- tells us clearly of Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus, had more than one wife at the same time, but there seems to be enough evidence contained in the Gospels which make this thought a very real possibility. And the only way to do that is to examine the accounts clearly and, of course, use common sense thinking. There's quite obviously has been somewhat of a concerted effort based in part on the secondary authors or the translators of the Gospels and the ages-old interjections of many Christian commentators in an attempt to confuse the true accounts of biblical history. Most, if not all, the examples of marriage portrayed in the New Testament leans towards a one-man, one-woman-only marriage and not the possibility of polygyny, of course, by culture and um, you know what, the tactics on the enemy, they pretty much have tried to dismiss uh, any idea that a man could have more than one wife in the New Testament. And of course, it, I mean, you heard some of the stuff that Pastor brought up in the debate, and the other things that uh, a lot of polygynous authors have written about proves that this is false. So it was there, it's just knowing how to look at it and how to compare it, of course, to um, the Torah and the Tanakh. This agenda, of course, can be quickly proven and easily seen not only by the false doctrines and practice of the Roman Catholic Church from day one until present, but also by the writings of the early, quote, church fathers and also by the laws enacted by the governments of that time in the area of marriage and all the way up to present day. Of course, we need to start at the beginning and identify key events which focus on or give information about the biological family of Jesus. And... um, uh, you know, and, and another thing I'll just say right up front immediately that, you know, if, if I would like to see somebody actually, you know, if they haven't got it conclusively yet, they'd be able at least uh, I can give enough information here where somebody else can actually add to it or look into it a little bit deeper and see if they can go and actually, you know, if it exists, you know, if it's actually something that's valid and it's, it's you know, authenticatable that, it, you know, we can actually find it. If not, it'll just be something that's a point in history that people can't argue against that saying it's not possible when, in fact, it can be very possible. Anyway, all right, we're going to start. Number one, I think I've got six or seven different areas and then some breakdowns from there. All right, number one fact, Joseph consummated with Mary after the birth of Jesus, or he was giving the, the command, and that's the order in which he did. He was supposed to have conducted himself. All right, Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 and then Matthew chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. And again, uh, appreciate it, Brother Paul, for um, sitting behind the scenes and posting these things for the saints to uh, you know, follow along with. Because if you've never joined into one of the Elder Becker's show, he reads pretty fast and he, he goes pretty quick. So uh, you all just bear with me. Hey, and it's all good to see you in the room. we got a lot of guests tonight, it looks like, too. Hallelujah. Uh, all the faithful Israelites in the room tonight, hey, good to have you all on board. Hallelujah. All right, Matthew chapter 1, verses 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this way. Oh, and before I get started, um, some of these things in the King James, but you're going to find one of my preferred uh, Bibles that I read quite a bit uh, is the Lamsa, the, the, the Peshetta, the Aramaic Lamsa version. Uh, of course, you can read through it, and there's some translatory challenges that are in there, um, especially in the book of Isaiah, but... I think it does a very good job of translating the sentiments of the Gospels and the letters and the writings in the New Testament. Um, and obviously, it's Lamps' New Testament, too, it, you know. So it, uh, um, I, I like the way that it reads. You know, my spirit, uh, you know, bears witness to it. So. Um, so you'll be hearing some of the quotes from that as well tonight. Anyway, so Matthew one eighteen. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When, as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together. She was found with child of the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 1, chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, as the angel Yahweh had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and the command was, and knew her not until she brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. You know, of course, this was fact. Uh, we all know of Joseph and Mary at this point is that Mary is betrothed to Joseph. And she's been espoused to Joseph. And between the two of them, 
of course they haven't had any children left. You haven't had any children yet outside of Jesus. So all we know is that we have Joseph, Mary, and the you know soon to come born King Yeshua Hamashiach, Jesus the Christ. And the reason I say is because there's nothing else mentioned in these verses about anybody else but these three. All right. All right. Number two, Joseph is described as the only um, is only taking his pregnant wife Mary to be censured, and as taking only his wife Mary and her son Jesus into Egypt and later returning. Now, some of my uh, captions, opening captions here, are a little bit broad, but I'll kind of tighten them up for you. All right, and this is the Lamsas Pachetta um, and, and Brother Ugly. I'm actually going to give the King James. Um, equivalent as well when I use Lamsas so everybody can see the comparison. At least I think I did that all the way across. All right, the book of Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And it says, um, And it happened in those days that there went a decree from Caesar Augustus to take a census of all the people in his empire. This... Um, <clears throat> This first, cen- this first census took place during the governorship of Quine- Quine- uh, Quirinius. See, my mind says one thing. My speech is saying something else. Quirinius, Qu- Quirinius that's what we call in Syria. And every man went to be registered in his own city. Joseph, all went up, Joseph also went up from Nazareth, the city of Galilee, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was the house and family of David with his acquired wife, Mary, while she was with child, that they might be registered there. And it came to pass while they were there that her days of deliverance were to be fulfilled. Um, the difference, the reason I use the, the Lamsa here is because it's going to explain to you more closely about the details because we're going to read the King James account, um, which is, you know, you have to go, when, especially when you're dealing with it, it's not that it isn't... Um, you know, an authoritative word because, you know, the Holy Spirit bears witness. It's just that you have to do a whole lot more going to look behind um, the wording in the King James. And I guess that's in a way that's a good thing is because it actually brings us to force, you know, if we're going to study, show ourselves a proof to actually investigate behind a lot of the words that's used in the King James. All right, Luke chapter 2, verses 1, again, in the King James. And, yeah, you got it up here. Is that, yeah, hallelujah. Anyway, I'll read this one anyway. Luke chapter 2, 1 through 6, the King James. And it came to pass in those days that there went a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house in lineage of David. And he, was, he went up because he went to be taxed with Mary as a spouse, wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. Okay, now we have to think, the word we have to look behind is taxed. And, and the reason that they actually went up to, you know, went down to their, their city, their home, their home city, their um, city of lineage, um, Bethlehem, was to be censored. Okay, anyway, um, the Greek or the Greek word 5083 tax is apolographo. Um, uh, Brother Ugly will have it up there, but there's a Greek 583 um, tax. It means to write off or copy from some pattern. This is the Thayer definition, by the way. To enter in the register of records. Specifically, going to enter in public records the names of men, their property, income. So it was a registration type thing. It was a census. They wanted to get Caesar Augustus called, um, you know, called the census to see what the, the the substance the people had in his empire, in his in his realm. Okay, <coughs> excuse me. Now the word tax, the Greek 583 means to write off the copy and to enter into a register of records, specifically to enter in public records the names of men, their property, and income. Those under the rule of Caesar Augustus were ordered to return to their families, family cities of ancestral lineage and give a reckoning of themselves and of their properties and goods. This was all for assessing values by which tax could be later levied. 
What is important about this account is that it shows that all were required to return to respective ancestral places. If it had not been so, then quite possibly Joseph would have made the journey alone and registered for his house to the Romans. But the true case is that because all were ordered to go, this placed Mary in the city of Bethlehem for the prophesied birth of the Messiah, which was foretold again by the prophets. It appears that when Joseph left out for Bethlehem to be censored, he departed only with his pregnant wife and no others. For as the account demonstrates, if there had been more members of the house of Joseph, then they too would have had to travel for the census and may have been mentioned in Luke's writings as part of the house of Joseph. All right, Luke chapter 2, verses 12 and 21. And I don't know if I've got it in here. Um, well, yeah, I think I do. Part of history here because it's actually pretty confusing. Um, and, and in fact, some of the study looks like I'm actually going off topic a little bit, but I'm not because you'll find out that there has to be provided a, a larger explanation of what's going on behind the scenes in order to get a clearer picture of what actually happened. Because um, quite honestly, the synoptic gobbles, gospels are uh, kind of confusing at times. All right, Matthew chapter 2, verses 12 and 12 through 16, and then 20 and 21. Matthew 2, 12 through 16, and then 20 and 21. Okay. One second. All right. Verse 12. And being warned of Yah in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And, of course, this is talking to the wise men. I skipped out a lot of part of the, the first 11 verses of the chapter because I'm sure that uh, most of you are very familiar with the um, this account in the book of Matthew and the birth of, of, of Jesus. Verse 13, and when they were departed, meaning the wise men, behold, the angel of Yah appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night, and departed into Egypt. And was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of by Yahweh, by the prophet, spoken of the master by the prophet, by Yahweh, by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wrath, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. And now verse 20 and 21, 20 and 21, yes, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother, um, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. And he arose, meaning Joseph, of course, and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. Now it appears as of this account that there was only Joseph, Mary, and Jesus to the entire house of Joseph. You know, the account tells us clearly in verse 14 that the only people who were with Joseph and his flight to Egypt were, of course, Mary and Jesus. There are, however, some questions which are brought to, be, brought to the forefront based on the details of this account. Number one, was Jesus still in infancy when he was taken into Egypt, or was he older? And obviously we're going to find out that this is a very widely accepted belief. If Joseph had already had other family members, would he have not taken them as well? And, and, yeah, boy, we're going to get off in all kinds of things. All right, with going, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of break down a paraphrase uh, the majority of Matthew, two, Matthew chapter 2 in the text. Um, this account tells us that the wise men, from the, you know, from, they came from the east, they traveled from the east, following a star, came to Jerusalem, and inquired of the religious leaders as to the whereabouts of the Messiah, the prophesied newborn king of Israel, who tells the wise men, these religious leaders, because they, they came to Jerusalem, who tell the wise men that this child was to be born in Bethlehem, a town located... Bethlehem was roughly six miles away from Jerusalem, just south, six miles south. So the wise men are then summoned to speak to Herod, the Roman Tetrarch, who, who had rule of the provinces that time, and specifically Jerusalem and Bethlehem. And his home, uh, incidentally, I just got in here in brackets, was 
actually is, 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 is what he calls permanent residence was in Jericho, which is some 18 miles to the north of there. So all these cities were in pretty good proximity of one another. Um, and, and, of course, Herod, when, when the wise men get before Herod, he questions them about this matter because it says in the Bible in Matthew that, you know, he was basically terrified. He's hearing this thing of this, this new king born in Israel, and, of course, it's God is ears because this is going to challenge his authority if this is actually real. And he questions them about this matter and requests that they return back to him and give a report after they had found the Messiah, meaning that the wise men, he told them to come back and let me know what you found out. You know, popular suggestion and tradition still favor Jesus as being a newly born infant, but is this really the case? And, of course, the reading of Matthew 1 and 2 gives the impression that Jesus was still in infancy when the wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem. And what's this got to do with possibly Joseph being a polygynous setting? Well, we're going to find out. That's why I say I have to go a little bit off track just a little bit to uh, demonstrate some things. Okay, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Now when Yahshua was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. So we get the impression, the way it's written in the opening verse, of verse 1 is that now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea in the days of Herod the king. And that, that kind of impresses on the mind that he was just a newborn infant. And if you feed off of Luke chapter 2, it makes the mind say that he was still in infancy. And verse 2, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Again, the preface is on, the preface is on born. Okay, there's somebody just born, and it's in Bethlehem. And when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him because it's like the first time he heard it. You know, there's this, uh, this um, you know, there's an infant been born in, in the city of Bethlehem. But anyway, we have to read on here. All right. Popular tradition never takes into account the distance the wise men traveled from the east to get to Jerusalem, which if they had come from a great distance, would have definitely meant that Jesus was no longer an infant when they found him, but perhaps months or even years older. And after the wise men find the young child, Jesus, and it says that he was found in a house by them and not in a manger or stable, then they are warned of the Most High not to return unto Herod, at which they departed for the respective homes by another way. Personally, my own personal opinion about where these wise men, it doesn't give us a number, so, um, you know, if there's anybody here that, still has a uh, um, uh, notion to hold fast to this perverted lie of Christmas and all of its pagan origins. There wasn't three wise men. The Bible never tells you at any one time how many there was. I think they get this out of the fact of how many gifts were given, but uh, the, the clear picture is it never gives you a specific amount. These were men that I personally believe that traveled actually from Abraham's uh, birth or from the Mesopotamia, from Ur of the Chaldees. Um, I don't know why, it's just impressed upon me that's where they came from, but I calculated that journey, and it's roughly, man, it's it's about 1,100 miles is what it is. So you figure walking, just walking 1,100 miles, how long it would take. Now, I don't think it would take a full two years, So, but I don't know. You know, if you you gauge what the children of Israel did in the wilderness, now they were, you know, they were uh, basically punished or judged to spend 40 years in the wilderness, but... The fact is the people would you know travel around and stop for many times so i don't know it's a it's a personal uh uh thing in, with me so it, it's not like it's you know got any um you know authentic authenticity it's just thought in my mind anyway let me get back on this all right but it appears by the wording of verse 13 that as soon as the wise men had left out to return to their own country an angel appears to joseph in a dream and warns him to take his family which, of course, we just read, it was written as only as Joseph, or as, as Mary, excuse me, and Yahshua, and fleeing to the land of Egypt because of Herod's future actions to destroy the young child Jesus. And then the Bible goes on to say that Herod figures out that he has been duped, and he orders the death of all the young children, specifically the males, the young boys living in Bethlehem, two years of age or younger. This, of course, leads to more questions, such as, if Jesus was, in fact, an infant child when the wise men from the east found him. Then why does Herod wait two years before taking any action? 
because obviously if it, it it doesn't take the man Bethlehem's only Bethlehem's only six miles down the road from Jerusalem and Herod even if he went back up to Jericho which is another what eighteen miles north of Jerusalem that's twenty five miles it, he, this guy is fearful this new king he's not going to wait two years to finally go out and find out that he'd been been duped you know if you hear understand what I'm saying it's just it's senseless it's uh, um, What's the word I'm looking for? It'll come up anyway. And number two, why does the Bible tell us in the book of Luke that after the circumcision of Jesus at Jerusalem, Joseph departs and returns to his own city, Nazareth, and yet as it appears in the book of Matthew, Joseph and his family flee into Egypt to escape Herod's decree of death to the young children of Bethlehem. We're going to look at that quickly because there's there's a, a point of confusion, not confusion, just conflicting uh, uh um, viewpoints and conflicting accounts of the early days of the Messiah and Joseph and Mary, of course. And it's all there. Again, like I said, I have to go off a little bit to bring it back and get a well more well-rounded uh, viewpoint of the establishment of Joseph's house in the early days of uh, the Messiah. All right, Luke chapter 2, verses 21 through 21 and 22, and then 39 and 40. All right, verse 21. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Yahshua, Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present, present him before the Most High. Of course, that would be at the temple. In verse 39, verse 40 of Luke chapter 2. And when they had performed all the things according to the law of the Most High, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of Yah was upon him. Now, if we try and rationalize the events, it becomes quite difficult. I mean, trying to combine the two. If we, must, if we attempt to combine these events of Matthew 2 and Luke 2 into one event, then this must, this is in capitals, this must preclude that everything outlined in these two accounts takes place in the span of 40 days, and that would be the 40 days of the purification of Yahshua, or, or Mary's purification for a newborn son. The shepherds, these are all the events that would have to take place in that 40-day time span in order to put Luke, Matthew chapter 2 and Luke chapter 2 together, because there's something going on here that isn't being told. All right, all right, these are, these are the events. The shepherds go to see the infant child, the wise men from the east come and, circum and, and then comes the circumcision of the infant's, infant Christ on the eighth day. Herod's decree to kill all the male children aged two and under. And then Joseph and family flee to Egypt. And then Herod dies and Joseph and his family return back to Israel. And then Joseph and Mary go to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices after her days of purification are accomplished. And Joseph takes his family and returns to Nazareth. And I actually looked to see, I don't know, maybe I missed it. Maybe somebody's got some enlightenment about it, but I don't think there's any prohibition against a woman in her days of purification from traveling at all. Um, she would just set apart for them 40 days. Anyway, <clears throat> this is simply an unrealistic chain of events, and when coupled with common sense reasoning, Bible prophecy and historical accounts, we can see that all Things transpiring over a 40-day period is utter nonsense. All right. Now, the popular consensus tells us that Jesus was born in the fall, near or during the Feast of Tabernacles. I believe it had to be during near because the Bible would tell us that, you know, the men were going up to the feast and, you know, they wouldn't have Joseph and Mary, you know, or uh, I lost. Anyway, you can tell by reading the accounts of the story that, it may have been near uh, tabernacles, but that may have been, you know, months off. Who knows? Uh, anyway, popular consensus tells us that Jesus was born in the fall, near during the Feast of Tabernacles, on, amazingly, September 11th, 4 BCE. And, hey, that's a popular birthday here with um, the saints. And I, you know, I mean, it, it's a recognition of the birth of, of, of somebody's uh, um, very highly favored individual in Israel. <laughs> I just put it like that. Hallelujah. Anyway, so I, I thought I thought that was kind of interesting. But anyway, th there's some historians that um, record the birth of Jesus as September 11th, um, 4 BCE. 
and there's either even some that argue it's uh, 6 BCE or before Common Era or 8 before Common Era. So, and that Herod died in March or April of 1 before 1 BCE in the city of Jericho. And that, that can be better substantiated because Josephus, if the wreck is credible, and a few other historic records that um, – Yeah, I don't know, Brother Ugly, but uh, anyway, this, um, you know, it, it, because of Josephus and everybody pretty much agrees the consensus that Herod's death is March 1st, around uh, March 1 BCE, you know, and there are unfortunately many different conclusions as to the birth date of Jesus and the death of Herod, but the understanding that Jesus was most definitely a young child can also be read in the prophets as reflecting on Matthew chapter 2, verse 15 which says um, in Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, when Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt when he was a child, not an infant. So we know that definitely Jesus was uh, a young child when, um, you know, Joseph and Mary went back into Israel. The fact is that Herod didn't wait two years before he realized that he had been had. I believe that Herod was told by the wise men during his diligent inquiry of Matthew 2.16 that they had been following the star for perhaps up to two years before arriving in Jerusalem. This points almost conclusively that the Messiah was a young child, very close to two years of age by the time the wise men from the east reached Bethlehem to bring the gifts to the young child Jesus. So why had Joseph taken Mary and Jesus back to Bethlehem some possible two years? Because that's where he received the warning to flee. This is where history helps provide, however vague, some probable answers. Because a man named Cyrenius, who we already read about in Luke chapter 2, verse 2, had been appointed to hold two periods during the early life of the Messiah of taxation, a census, and a taxation time for the people of the land of Judea, which we read about, which one of them, which we read about in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, um, which we understand to have been a census of the people only, and that their assets, and after a number of years, as history tells us, the actual tax was collected. So something pulled them back. This would have been possible the reason why Joseph, Mary, and Jesus returned back to Bethlehem. It would have also been at this time that the wise men showed up that Herod, some days later, figured he'd been duped and that Yah had in the warning the angel had Joseph to take his family and flee into the land of Egypt. And I hope everybody picked up on that because between the two accounts, you know, you can't have Joseph, Jesus is an infant, and then Joseph, you know, the wise men coming when he's still an infant, having to go, you know, flee to Egypt and then not being able to fulfill Matthew 2, where he actually goes after 40 days of Mary's purification, goes up to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices. And then the Bible says he went back to Nazareth. So at what point did he flee to Egypt? The obvious answer is because he had to go back to Bethlehem a second time. And I believe it's part of the taxation. You have to go back and and review the historical records a little bit more. The documentation, there's a little bit of, you know, uh, uh, disagreement as to dates, and but for the most part, there's you know, uh, an agreeable discourse that there was, in fact, two tax times of the, quote, taxation. So for now, though, now as to the why I found it necessary to come or cover some of the past history, simply to help prove that it was only Joseph, Mary, and Jesus that were family, during the first years of the life of the Messiah, and that there appears no, that no other children were produced from this marriage while in Bethlehem or in Egypt. The other sensible question to ask is if Joseph had other children or other wives at that point in time, would it have not also take, uh, would he have not had not also taken them back with him to Bethlehem the second time? Um, this is if this was the case and then fled to Egypt without them. You know what I'm trying to say? If his family, uh, We're going to get into that, too, because there's a whole bunch of um, uh, Roman Catholic history behind this. There's, there's a very um, uh, well-exposed agenda behind this now that we can see it, uh, a lot of things about Jesus' natural family. Now, this is highly doubtful that Joseph had any other family at this point, for there is simply no mention or any allusion to this possibly contained in the Bible or historically. And again, going back when, when Mary was pregnant with, uh, you know, with, with Yahshua um, because of they were all ordered to go back, where was everybody else in Joseph's family? And, and the only possible um, 
Uh, I'm going to say that. We're going to get back to that. All right, jo- Joseph's financial status is in question. All right, Luke, going back to chat, Luke chapter 2, verses 21, and verses 21 through 24, and then Leviticus, Leviticus 12, verses 6 through 8. All right, starting in Luke chapter 2, verse 21. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising the child, his name was called Yahshua, Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And we're just rereading some of the stuff we already read. And we're going down, yeah, verse 22. And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moshe were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Most High. And as it is written in the law of the Most High, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy unto Yahweh. Verse 24. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law or in the Torah of the Most High, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So they went back to, after the days of her sanctification, according to the Torah, and they were offering two turtle doves or two young pigeons. Okay? Leviticus chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. And when the days of her purifying are fulfilled, this is, of course, the the Torah, the direct quote from where this was taken in Luke chapter 2. And when the days of her purifying are fulfilled, for a son and for a daughter, she shall bring a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or turtle dove for a sin offering under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation unto the priest. Who shall offer it before the Most High and make atonement for her, and she shall be cleansed from the issue of her blood? This is the law of her that hath both born a male or a female. In verse eight, and if she not be and if she be not able to bring a lamb, then she shall bring two turtles, or be turtle doves, or two young pigeons, one of them for a burnt offering, the other for a sin offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for her, and she shall be clean. Now the Torah in Leviticus is spelled out quite plainly. Uh, we have a lamb along with one turtle dove or a lamb along with one pigeon uh, as a burnt offering and a sin offering. Or the other possibility is is uh, either two turtle doves or two pigeons. One, again, is offered as a burnt offering. The other one is a sin offering. It does tell us in Luke's account that Joseph and Mary had presented either two turtle doves or two pigeons to satisfy the requirements of the purification laws, but nowhere does it imply that a lamb was used. This offers us a few different conclusions as to why no lamb was included in the offspring description, the offering description. Um, well, ob- one, number one is that a lamb was, you know, just wasn't available. I don't know if that's that's kind of far fetched, but uh, number two that Joseph didn't have the ability to transport a lamb to Jerusalem to be sacrificed, which is highly unlikely, seeing that the distances from Jerusalem to Bethlehem is only about six miles. And he could have figured out something to get one there, okay? Number three, that the word lamb was simply omitted from Luke chapter 2, verse 24. And number four, that Joseph was a poor man, that he was not able to afford the cost of buying a lamb for the burnt offering, having to settle on offering of birds, which were obviously a whole lot cheaper to purchase because if we understand by the accounts of the Gospels, and I think they're pretty well straightened out that he was in a traveling mode when he got to Bethlehem, and it's highly unlikely that if he had any light or any 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 of his own uh, lambs or goats or anything that they would have gone with him in the journey. I mean, because he is coming from Nazareth at one point, and I don't know how far that was, but it was a lot farther than traveling from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. Um, uh, yeah, number four, and of course that he was not able to afford the cost of buying a lamb for burnt offering, having to settle on. The offering of the birds, which were obviously a whole lot cheaper to purchase. You know, it's a stretch to say that a lamb was not available to satisfy the offering. As the Bible tells us of the shepherds that left off attending their flocks, which may have been flocked to sheep. And what I'm saying is that he could have went and purchased them, you know, because we we have proof that there were shepherds in the air. They went to visit the newborn king. Honestly, I believe Joseph was a younger man who did not possess great wealth or abundance. If this was indeed the case, then it stands to reason that Joseph, at least up to the point in his life, had not had any other family. For if Joseph could not afford the cost of one lamb, then how is it reasonably accepted that he was able to 
to care for a family of nine people, you know, having the, the resources, because as we're going to find out lady and, and, and later, as most of you are already familiar with um, the, the accounting of Jesus' natural family, biblically, you know, it came to nine people, which was Joseph, Mary, Jesus, James, Joseph, Jr., um, Simon, Judas, and at least two daughters, at least. You know, Joseph had at least two daughters or Jesus having at least two sisters. It makes more sense that Joseph had become more financially stable during the early child of Jesus. Joseph was established in his trade. Now, this this thing of Joseph being an old man, um, that's got historical uh, arguments all over the place. And you'll find out that most of it is the agenda is highly pushed um, due to the um, of course, the agendas of the, of the Roman Catholic Church, Church and the early Church Fathers. We'll talk about that a little bit, too. Now, it appears that Joseph and Mary had only Jesus at least up until age 12. All right, Luke chapter 2, verses 41. Let me see, 41 through 51, so these 10 verses. Uh, give me one second here. All right, anyway. All right, verse 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, talking about Yeshua, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. Actually, after the commandment of the feast, not the custom. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. Verse 44. But they, supposing him to have been in the company when a day's journey And they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintances. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his and understanding his answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dealt with us? Behold, Father, and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto him, How is it that you sought me? Uh, Wist it not that I must be about my father's business? Wist. What a word, wist. Wist ye not that I be about my father's business? And they understood not that saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them, but his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. Now in Luke two, Luke, uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 44 the wording tells us that Joseph and Mary sought out Jesus amongst their, quote, kinfolk and acquaintances, but never refers to other siblings or immediate family members such as another wife and possibly servants. All right, we have to look behind the word kinsfolk because it's not as a lot of time as portrayed. The, the, word, uh, the word kinsfolk in the Greek is the 4773, and, and this is in the Thayer. Um, definition, it means sugen, sugenis, sugenis, something like that. Of the same kin, akin to related by blood, in a wider sense of the same nation of, of a fellow countrymen. Now, the word kinsman is never used to describing immediate family, but always in the sense of cousins. And we're going to show this by using the same Greek word in the Gospels, or those relatives closely associated by blood. In fact, upon further examination of the verses which use the word or kinsfolk, the Greek 4773, there is an all too clear difference in those that are kin as versus those that are relatives as those which are considered immediate family based on the way that this is used in the context of the Gospels. All right, Mark chapter 6, verse 4. Mark chapter 6, verse 4, we're going to use a few different examples of the Greek 4773 and show how the writer, writers actually made distinction between kinsfolk and um, biological family and that type of thing. Mark 6, 4, And Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own, quote, kin, that would be the Greek 4773, or related by blood, and in his own house, meaning his direct family, all right? Luke chapter 1, verse 36. 
Luke chapter 1, verse 36. And it says, And behold, thy cousin, which is the Greek 4773 again, kinsfolk are related by blood, and the same kin and the same, same family. And behold, thy cousin, Elizabeth, she has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who is called bearing. Again, a clear demonstration that kinsfolk is talking about somebody that's uh, a cousin for a second, but not immediate family. And then, of course, the Messiah himself, when Jesus is giving discourse, you know, in, in one of the in, in the book of Luke, he actually breaks down. He doesn't lump it together. And so we're going to look at that. That's Luke chapter twenty-one, verse sixteen. Luke twenty-one, sixteen. And you shall be betrayed by both parents and brethren. And if you look in the law, it says it actually says brothers. And we're going to look at that too. And kinsfolk and friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death. He didn't lump them all together. Messiah actually strategically named the different groups. And if you look behind the word kinsfolk in here too, it's also the Greek 4773. So it appears that Mary during the, and Joseph during the span of 12 years, um, it appears that they didn't have any other children. There's no reason ever given for why this was, but it does point to the fact that, again, if we use the word defining the Greek word kinsfolk, uh, kinsfolk as the context displays all through the, the Gospels is that it never talks about immediate family. So Jesus was amongst cousins and acquaintances, or the family was, but it doesn't ever specifically mention um, any other six biological family members that Joseph obviously had at some point, um, or anybody else for that matter it doesn't talk about servants. It just Again, kinsfolk and acquaintances. All right, uh, Jesus had siblings when his ministry began at age 30. All right, we're going to talk about real quickly here, proving that his, his ministry began at age 30. Luke chapter 3, verses 22 and 23. All right, Luke chapter 3, verse uh, 22. And the Holy Spirit descending in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven and, which said, Thou art my beloved Son, and thee I am well pleased. Verse 23, And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, which was of, the, of Hillel. And so, of course, in these two verses, as far as we can ascertain, Jesus had reached age 30 before he had done any miracles, and, um, and, of course, John chapter 2 says specifically that, and this was the beginning of miracles, and we're going to go into that, was at the, the, the wedding feast in Cana. Um, and, I've, you know, there's, there's, uh, when I was looking into this, I seen these books before I went back and looked at them. And, there, I mean, there's books that are written there. You can, you, you can see Catholicism all over them. Some of these, you know, lost apocryphal books or some of these books of one we had to do i forget what the name of it right now but it the, the infancy of jesus and his early his childhood years and and it talks about all these mighty miracles that he did as a, as a young boy and all this stuff but how is it nobody heard of him until you know at this certain age when he you know and people started getting astonished only when he got older and and, and it says clearly in john that the beginning of his miracles was exhibited at the feast of canaan so Obviously, you're dealing with some. There's an all these things are written behind for an agenda. They're there to to steer the mind a certain way to you know um, get people desensitized to uh, what's really going on. That's why these things are written. Because I mean, as a Catholic for 37 years, I never questioned none of it. Why? I mean, uh, we had what the New Testament what New Testament said. That was it. The the Old Testament the law had been done away with. There was no sense in going back to look at anything because it didn't have any relevance because it had been done away with. But that was the one thing that was being kept from the eyes of the people. If they had gone back and read for themselves, they would have said that, you know, they would have found out, obviously, as we all know today as Israelites, that, you know, basically that they left out the meat of everything. But, no, oh, thank you, we have it all now. All right, John chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 5, and then verse 12. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. So the writer 
uh, in the book of John, tells us specifically that the mother of Jesus was there. Mary and Jesus' uh, mother was there. And both Jesus was summoned and called and his disciples to the marriage. Okay, so it's right in the, they're near their hometown of Nazareth, it's in the region of Galilee. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, talking to Jesus, they have no wine. And Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I do with thee? And mine hour is not yet come. And th- here's what his mother saith unto the servants. Whoso, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Now, verse 12, I'm going to read the King James first, and I'm going to read the Lamses, uh, George Lamses' um, uh, translation. And after this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brother. So after the wedding feast, we have a description here of, of Jesus departing with um, his mother and his brethren and his disciples, a distinction made between these three different sets of people, these three different people, the mother, the brother, and the disciples, and they continue there not many days. Now, Lamsa's edition says, verse 12, after this he went down to Capernaum, he and his mothers, and it actually clearly uses the word, and his brothers, and his disciples, and they remained there a few days. Now, the word brothers in the Greek is the Greek eighty Adelphos, um, and it means the Thayer definition. Again, I really like the Thayers. I just think it's more descriptive. It kind of fills in a whole lot of more. The Strong's tends to be a whole lot more, uh, you know, kind of, uh, it, it's not very detailed. It's more left to the imagination. It's, uh, in the other case, it gives you one thing, and that, 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 that's the context of everything you have to draw from the one thing, whereas Thayers gives you a more well-rounded meaning, I think, um, behind the, the Greek words. All right, again, Adelphos, it means a brother, whether born of the same parents, same two parents, or only of the same father or mother. Again, that definition, a brother, whether born of the same two parents, or only of the same father or mother. Anyway, they're they're all, all the brothers in this instance, and the first definition is they are related directly by blood through the mother and the father, immediate family members. And the number two means having the same national ancestor, belonging to the same people or countrymen, as we call each other brethren, brothers. You know, we're all brothers together in the most high, spiritually. And then number three means any fellow or man, a uh, fellow believer united to another by the blood of bond of affection, an associate in the employment office, a brethren in Christ. And the word brethren in the, in the Strong's, I threw it in here, uh, just for comparative reasons. Again, it's Adelphos, Greek, the Greek number 80. And all strong says um, the womb. That's it. It has the womb, a brother literally or figuratively near or remote. That's the biggest definition give. It just says, you know, actually coming from the womb, a brother in that context. So they're all tied together through birth. And the word sister, um, we're going to read about it later, but I threw it in here right now because I have to bring out a comparison between the two. Again, making the distinction and breaking down in the Gospels how these things were written and looked at. They were they were written and you know presented for distinction purposes. All right, the Greek sister is the Greek seventy nine Adelphe. Remember the brothers of Delphos and the sisters of Delphe in the feminine form, and it means a full or own sister, O-W-N, sister, your own sister, one connected by the tie of a Christian or an Israelite religion. The Greek word for sister is Adelphi, which is a feminine noun, refers to that which has to do with females, whereas the word Adelphos is a masculine noun and refers to that which is male in general. Um, And I have something here in brackets that and what is important to note is that in the definition of the word Adelphos, or brothers, it never distinguishes in its definition family as it never includes brothers as in a father or brothers as in a mother or brothers as in a sister because the King James used the word brethren. So if you actually use the word brothers, it's, you can't lump in um, father, mother, sister. It's given almost exclusively to blood, blood brothers born in the same family. Now, St. Jerome, one of the early Catholic fathers, um, as it had attempted in his writings to connect Jesus' brethren 
is not brothers, but rather cousins. He he didn't use the Greek word um, adelphos, but he was actually trying to use the Greek word kinsfolk and identify those that are considered like here in, in John's example of the wedding feast of Canaan. He was trying to say that they were um, sagenes, sagenes, in kinfolks instead of using what the translators said as brethren or brothers, uh, the Greek idea Delphos. So that history, and of course, if you know the history of, of, of quote, if you say St. Jerome, it's already pretty much tells you who, who his father was or who was, he was representing. Of course, the Roman Catholic Church, he was the one that was, um, you know, asked to do, um, uh, um, to actually write the first Latin Bible for, uh, Latin translation for the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, back in the early days, this was just one of the many. Exa- <clears throat> Excuse me. This is just one of the many examples of the early Christian Church attempting to portray Mary, the mother of Jesus, as a perpetual virgin. They had to. They've had to through thousands of years convince people that she had never been allowed to have any of the children. That she had to remain in that virginity state, untouched from um, flesh and blood men. And those which hold that the brethren of Jesus were indeed just that, blood brothers, have to insist that all of his natural family siblings were born long before Mary showed up, thereby keeping their tradition that Mary was at one time mother and untainted virgin by the way of her husband Joseph, if that made sense. So they actually, um, if they're going to hold to the fact that Jesus' four brothers and his two sisters, as far as you know, might have been more than two, were actually blood relatives or Joseph's actual offspring, then they had to portray them as older or before Mary came on the scene um, in order to hold that Mary was never responsible for having any other children besides Jesus because there's no other children written besides the four brothers and, as far as we know, two sisters or more. Yeah, exactly. Joseph knew her. That's true. Now, um, his brother ugly got up on the stream, but the fact of the matter is the Bible Gospels never one time um, give us any indication that she ever had any other children, but um, the Catholics are doing it to fulfill their own agenda, obviously, because they, they, they got Mary venerated. Um, she is the thing that you look for for worship and salvation. It isn't Yahshua. Obviously, that's their tenet being part of the Catholic Church for years. It, it, anybody would know that. Just go and look. That's the way these dogs operated. Anyway, a great many things are found in these accounts in the second chapter of John. One, that Joseph is not mentioned in any aspect, meaning quite possibly, and we're talking about the, the, the wedding feast at Cana, meaning quite possibly that he was not simply not mentioned as being in attendance of the feast. He was not able to attend or that he had had previously passed away. And Mary addressed the servants about doing whatever Jesus instructed them to do. Now, were these the servants of the governor of the feast, or were these the servants of the house of Joseph? Interesting perspective. It would be more likely that the servants were of the house of Joseph for a number of reasons. All right. Yeah, Brother Ugly, I know what you're saying, too. Um, yeah. That of Joseph, okay, it, it would be more likely that the servants were of the house of Joseph for a number of reasons. That of Joseph was yet living, his servants accompanying his wife and family. That's what they were doing. The servants were actually with the family members. It may have been out of order to instruct another man's servants, and besides, Jesus' and his mother were having a one-on-one discussion about the wine and it's hardly likely that those servants were of the governor of the feast standing right there with them in the midst of this conversation. It makes much more sense that these servants were of the house of Joseph. The importance of the servants belonging to the house of Joseph would indicate that Joseph at that time had some form of financial stability, meaning that over the years, at least we know up until Jesus being age 30, that he would actually, in his practice as a carpenter and whatever else he had going on, he was actually able to to get some decent income and be financially had the financial stability to actually own servants and not only being able to take care of the necessities of the servants, but all possibly, and more importantly, 
having the additional finances to take on an additional wife or wives. This chapter also presumably documents the first time that Jesus mentioned having brothers. It's the first account we read that he's actually talked about having um, biological brothers. These are not spoken of as kinsmen or acquaintances, but brethren as in biological brothers. It is possible that if there were sisters in this number that they may have been lumped all together, but highly unlikely, as it shows in other Gospels, that there's a distinction made between brothers and sisters, again, in the word Adelphos and Adelphi, and again, kinsmen. And we, we read that in examples, Mark 6, 3, Matthew 13, 55, 56, and, and other places, if you feel like going to look. And, the, and, and as the definition of brethren showed, the word Adelphos never defines for us family within its meaning, and this must conclude that all of the brethren were all males. This then would have to mean that there, were, there was at least an 18-year difference between Jesus and the oldest of his siblings. For at age 12, as we saw earlier, it was not spoken of as Jesus having brothers, only kinsmen, and that the Messiah began the ministry at age 30. That's your 18-year span between age 12 and age 30. Also in John chapter 2, verse 12, the wording tells us that these brethren were not described as being sons of Mary. They were never described as being sons of Mary. Only Jesus was ever being described as the son of Mary, but only as the brothers or siblings of Jesus, as Brother Ugly mentioned already. Now, it's rather puzzling that Joseph and Mary had no children other than Jesus up and until he was 12, age 12. And then all of a sudden, to start producing children, having at least six children after that, as it will be shown later in the study, you know, you can, the proof of the children in the Gospels, or his brothers and sisters, in a time span of 18 years. You know, it, it, all of a sudden for 12 years, nothing, and then 18 years, bang, at least six children. Four boys and at least two sisters and not more. Um, also, this would have to mean that all the Jesus siblings were 18 years of age or younger, which is a definite fact in um, uh, making it very viable and very possible that Joseph had taken on another wife, all right? It's the age of uh, Jesus' siblings. That's a big question. That's why it's so confused in in the history. Um, What also should be noted is that Joseph disappears from the scene of the Gospels from when Jesus was about 12 years old. He's never mentioned again. If the death of Joseph did indeed come sometime shortly after Jesus at age 12 years of age, then Mary must have given birth to at least seven children in 12 years. All right, Jesus' brothers and two or more sisters, I covered it. Assuming that not every child she gave birth to survive infancy, more than seven labors would be required during that period. All of this with the understanding that accords, no, I'm talking about from the time that Jesus was born until the time he it shows us that at age 12, it was Mary and Joseph and Jesus going, you know, coming back from the feast. But if these siblings were all responsible by Mary herself, this would have been done in the 12-year time span. Um, assuming, again, that not every child she gave birth to, to survive infancy, more than seven labors would be required during that period. All of this with the understanding that according to the laws of purity, after given birth, we have almost an entire year set aside alone for the days of purification, thusly reducing the space of having six children to the time of 11 years or less, and also taking into consideration a normal menstrual cycle for the women. This also adds to the reduction of the time span of for having six more children. Lastly, we have to consider the time spent nursing each respective child before weaning. There's all these factors that you have to consider in trying to um, say that from Jesus' Jesus's birth and Mary's first child till it would have been her seventh child was born in the span of less than 11 years. Is it probable? Uh, could it happen? Yeah, but it, it, because it's never written about, never alluded to, never mentioned, it's, it's really hard to believe that the writers of the Gospels left out uh, some of these more, uh, you know, fine details, especially, I know the context was on uh, the, the work of the Messiah and what he did and what he went through, and that was the record, but come on, even when Joseph passed, his, his earthly father, I mean, there's no mention of it. It, it is kind of peculiar, but, um, you know, uh, what do you say? It's not there, it's not there. Then you have to go by what 
the Christian commentators and early church fathers have written, unfortunately. All right, let me see what time it is. I think we're going to take a break um, because I've been long-winded here, and you probably all, like me, need to um, attire to to the bathroom. Okay, well, I'll see you back here in a few minutes. Shalom, this is Sister Wenda. I hope that all of you are enjoying the broadcast that you're listening to right now. We appreciate each and every last one of you, our faithful listeners and supporters of the Straightway Truth radio broadcast. We try to make sure that we do our due diligence and do our best to ensure that you have the best broadcast as well as the truth coming to you in the hour that we're living in right now. If you would like to help us in this endeavor, your offering will be greatly appreciated in the work of the Ministry of the Most High Yah. Our mailing address for your gift offering or letter of support is Charles Dowell Jr. Charles Dowell Jr. And Dowell is spelled D-O-W-E-L-L. 506 Ellington Drive. Ellington is spelled E-L-L-I-N-G-T-O-N. P.O. Box 32, Lafayette, Tennessee, And Lafayette is spelled L-A-F-A-Y-E-T-T-E-37083. Again, our mailing address is Charles Dowell, Jr., 506 Ellington Drive, P.O. Box 32, Lafayette, Tennessee, 37083. If you would like to contact us by way of phone, the country code is 1, area code 615-688-3025. That's 1-615-688-3025. You may leave a message there, and, be the Father's will, we will do whatever we can to try to return your message. It is our hope and our prayer that as you continue to listen to the Straightway Truth Ministry, and as you apply the teachings of this ministry, that you are finding peace and growth within you, your family, and life as well. Please tell others, so that the truth may also have an impact and touch others' lives, so that they may enjoy the benefits of the truth of Jesus Christ, just like we all are. Shalom, the King is coming. Shalom, shalom. Yeah, that's right. Be at peace. The king is coming. Peace, peace, peace. Hallelujah. I have no idea what I just did. Oh, there we're back up. All right. I'm glad everybody's uh, still with me, and we're still back in the saddle here again. We're going to go ahead and try to conclusion conclude this here. We should conclude this in this next hour. I hope I'm not going too fast for everybody, and, um, you know, you're kind of um, getting a an understanding of, uh, of the different angles and stuff that can actually provide um, you know, not concrete evidence, but the very distinct possibility that Joseph did indeed have multiple wives. All right, continuing on. Mary is never mentioned as having any other children. Okay, we have to cover this. There is not one instance in the Bible that we read that Mary had birthed any other children than the Messiah. She is only referenced as the mother of Jesus, never the mother of any other children. And I challenge you to go do something. I didn't want to list it all, but if you go back through the Bible and look, and you type in the mother of, um, almost in every instance, I think every one, it only describing a single son, the mother of. You know, it, it's this was the mother of this particular son, the mother. And, it, and, and every time this, uh, this uh, mother didn't have any other children, she just had the one son. And that had a lot of time it had to do with... Um, you know, the royalty, the kings, um, you know, uh, like Athaliah. She only had one son, and she killed all of the stepson so that her son could be uh, the king. And then, remember, the one, was, the one was taken away and whisked away, so he could become king later, but it's there if you want to go look. So I'm just saying in the context, the way that the Bible was written, when it says the mother of, almost in every instance, um, it's just um, referring to a, a one son, not the other sons. And in fact, to take it a step farther, when it mentions um, the mother, most of the time it'll break down 
if not all the, the other children or the other sons, it'll at least include some of them. Um, so it, it, it's just a note. It's just a, uh, observation. Um, you know, I might've missed one. I'm just saying, but what I did look at, that's the way that it was pretty much presented every time. Okay. Going back to this and we're going to Lamsa's George Lamsa's new Testament Aramaic Pesheta. And we're going to look in the book of John chapter 19, verse 25 through 27. And then after that, the King James 19, 25 through 27, the book of Johann, uh, John. Now there was standing by the cross of Jesus, his mother. So that, so the, the description that we're opening up here is that we have people going to be standing by the stake. All right. Of that. Our Messiah is being hung on at this time. Um, so we have standing by the stake as they got written here, cross, uh, of, of Yahshua, his mother, of course, that being Mary, his mother's sister, and Mary of Cleopas. Not, we're going to find out there's two of these guys, too. And Mary of Magdala. This is Lamsa's. And when Jesus saw his mother and his disciple, whom he loved standing, he said to the, his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that very hour, the disciple took her, with him again that that was the key thing in verse and from that very hour the disciple took her with him um meaning that that he, he she became um his mother and he became her son and we're going to go and explain that a little bit more all right in the king james verse 25 now there stood by the cross of jesus his mother and his mother's sister mary the wife of cleophas and mary magdalene and when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. And, and then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own, and in, in uh, quotations, or italicize, home. Now there are a few points which, much, which must be addressed in this account. One is that it is obvious that Joseph is dead at this point. He has to be. I mean, I don't want to say it's it's absolutely, you know, uh, has to be that way, but all points, because of the way this thing was laid out, uh, appears that he almost and certainly was dead at this time. For had Joseph been living, it's doubtful and highly improbable that Jesus would have told John to care for Mary as John would for his own mother and take Mary unto himself and as provider and caregiver. If Joseph had yet been living, then Mary would have still been under his authority and would have returned to the house of Joseph. Also, this account helps to support that Mary did not have any other children, for if she had no doubt, she would have fallen under the care of the Messiah's biological or his stepbrothers or his actual brothers and sisters. This pattern is demonstrated very well in the story of the book of Ruth. And, and we're going to look at something in one of Paul's letters. Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. And this, this is detailing what happens to the structure of a family upon the deaths of um, the immediate sons. All right, Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Malan and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. I have no idea why my mouth is so dry. What in the world? Oh, how are you? And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. So up until they had the whole family together, um, you know, everybody in the house, and then, uh, you know, the dad dies, the husband and the father dies. And, and of course, what, what's um, key to see here is that after um, Elimelech died, Naomi, the mother, and the wife automatically was taken by her two sons. She was left and her two sons there. They all remained together. She was still with him even after the husband had died. You know, kind of paralleling if Joseph had died, if, G, if, if Mary had other children, sons, um, like the four sons that um, the Bible tells us that, that were sons of Joseph, she probably in all likelihood would have went to their protection. Anyway, 
as a widow. But verse 4, And they took them wives, talking about Naomi's two sons, took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Orpha, and then the other name of the other, Ruth, of course. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and Chilion died also, both of them. So what we have left is the three women. And and the women was left of her two sons, and they were all together. This is just telling you that she was still being cared for by her immediate family, um, Naomi. And then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she heard in the country of Moab how the Most High had visited his people and given them bread. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law. Now this is strictly um, focusing on the daughters. Go, return ye each to her mother's house. The Most High deal kindly with you as we have dealt with the dead and with me. Meaning, So you can see the structure when it worked back in the days of ancient Israel. When the men were all gone, it was just the women. They would disperse back to um, their houses or their, their, uh, their father's houses. Here it says mother's house. But in verse 9, and the master grant you that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them and lifted up their voice and wept. As we can see, after the death of Naomi's husband, Elimelech, Naomi fell under the care of her sons, Milan and Chilion. It's clear that her two sons were not younger men or boys, and she was there to be the, and she was the one being responsible to take care of them. But these two sons soon married and took the responsibility of caring for their mother just like the example we have of Jesus on the stake talking to John, um, giving him the basically ownership of or the son that was responsible for taking care of the widowed mother. And it was only after two sons had died that Naomi instructed two daughters, and we went through all that. Um, but unlike the case of Mary, she was given a protector and caregiver, adopted son in the likes of John the Apostle. Had Mary had other sons, she no doubt would have done that which was done with Naomi and had been taken care of as a widow by her remaining sons. All we have is this example to draw from. So, and I think it's a, a pretty good reflection of the, the, of the tradition of our people. Okay, and we're going to look at something else here, too. Um, we can also see a pretty, dear, a pretty clear demonstration of how widows are to conduct themselves and what their role in the body of Yah is. Okay, First Timothy chapter 5, verses 1 through uh, four, First Timothy five one through four in the King James, and then it's going to be verse four in the Lamsa. And it says, "Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as father, and younger men as brethren. The elder women assist the elder women, excuse me, as mothers; the younger as sisters, with all purity. Honor widows that are widows indeed." Verse four. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them first. Sh- Learn first to show piety at home and requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before Yah. Okay, in Lamsa's version, in verse 4, 1 Timothy 5, 4, it's worded like this. If any of the widows have children or great or grandchildren, and if you look behind the word nephews, I don't know why in the King James they use nephews, but it actually, um, even the Greek definition of nephews is grandchildren. So anyway, if any have widows or children or grandchildren, mean those that are specific to that family's bloodline. Let them know that let them know that aid should be sought first sought from those of their own household, so that the children have the opportunity to repay their obligations to their parents. For this is acceptable for Yah. So if the other siblings, the other four brothers, for example, would have been Mary's direct siblings, and then even according to Paul's words here, she would have went and been taken care of by them. Okay, that's the, that's the point I'm trying to make. I mean, again, this is open to a wide range discussion because there's nothing ever says anywhere that Joseph had two wives at the same time. But the fact is, he had two wives. That you can't deny that fact. Um, if Mary, the mother of Jesus, yet had other children at home, and especially younger children, then by Paul's definition. What she states is acceptable for Yah. Mary would have been placed in a position where her immediate family would have provided for her needs and not her fam- not the family John, the disciple of Jesus I just got done talking about. All right. Uh, we're going to take a little bit closer look at Joseph, Joseph as much as we can. There's not much written uh, about him, and um, unfortunately because of that, 
or fortunately um, examining some of this, Joseph, and the, and the immediate players in this, we're going we're to have to go into history to try to get um, some idea of how people were representing or writing about things to uh, present, you know, a certain picture, a certain image, try to, you know, portray for us a way a, a certain storyline was actually supposed to be read or, under, excuse me, understood. All right. If Joseph had already passed by the time that Jesus went to the wedding feast at Cana at age 30, then the entire bi- biological family of the Messiah, as it appears, may have been birthed by Mary, the only mentioned wife of Joseph. But this seems highly unlikely as the wording in John 2.12 only alludes to Mary being the mother of Jesus, not of the other brothers. So quite logically, if Mary is now responsible for birthing any of the children, this then ultimately concludes that Joseph had at least one other wife or possibly more. And we already know that that's not, I don't even know why I got that written. That's a, that's a fact. Oh, okay, Luke chapter 2, verse 33 through 35. All right, Luke chapter 2, 33 through 35. And, jo- and you can tell that most of, you know, you can tell how little detail there is because we keep going back to Luke or Matthew. You know, you have to because that's about really the only, there's other places, but that's where most of the meat of the life of Joseph is at. Anyway, uh, verse 33, And Joseph and his mother marveled, and his mother, excuse me, marveled at those things which were spoken of him, talking about the prophecy coming from, um, uh, it would have been Simeon. And Okay, and Simeon blessed them. Again, again, this is talking about um, at what point can we kind of guess that Joseph had already passed. And that, that sets the stage for what time frame, at least if, if the children, if he had time frame after he had, uh, Mary had birthed Jesus up until his death, was there enough age in there for him to produce more children? Or is according to the tradition of the church historians that um, all these children came prior to Mary coming on the scene? Anyway, and Joseph and his mother marveled at those things that were spoken of him, talking spoken about Jesus, the child infant. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, meaning he's turning his attention unto Mary. Behold, this child is set for the raw, for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Verse thirty five Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also. Men, the context was Simeon is talking and having a discussion with Mary. Uh, he's speaking unto Mary, and he said, The sword shall pierce through thy own soul, meaning Mary's soul, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. In this account, Simeon prophesied, <clears throat> excuse me. In this account, Simeon prophesied before Joseph and Mary, but it appears that the last part of his dialogue was meant strictly for Mary, as Simeon is written as saying to Mary, and not to Joseph, that her child, meaning not Joseph's child, but her child, will be set for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and the prophecy of the Messiah's death and resurrection, and the sword should pierce through the heart of Mary, meaning that she and not Joseph will be there to see the death and resurrection of the Messiah, and that she would feel the pain of it as she was witnessing to the sufferings and his death on the stake. However, I mean, however, there does seem to be a possibility that Joseph was indeed living when the Messiah was 30 years old. It is purely a case of interpretation, though, but there is some slight evidence that Joseph was still on the scene, at least until Jesus started his ministry. John chapter 6, verses 41 and 42. John 6, 41 and 42. And it reads... Hmm. Oh, I have to drink of water. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. In verse 42, And they said, Is not this in Jesus? Is this not Yeshua, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I come down from heaven? Now, the way in which verse 42 is worded definitely presents us with the possibility that Joseph was, quote, still living, as the wording says, whose father and mother we know. In a present tense, and not whose mother we know, but father we once knew or have known. 
So what am I trying to say? That if Joseph was still living, how was it that he was never mentioned in the company with Jesus, Mary, and the mother of Jesus, and the brothers of Jesus? It is apparent by the accounts in the Gospels that Mary and the brothers of Jesus on occasion traveled short distances to see and to speak with Jesus. Now, because the reason I put that in there, because, I mean, to me it certainly looks like he may have been alive at this time, but on the other part of it, why did the writers never mention Joseph at all ever traveling with Mary and the other brothers? I mean, it, it's never mentioned there one time. Again, history is very vague, especially in the Gospels, but, you know, these church historians and these commentators, early church, they try to make up the hedge and give us, and even between that they can't figure out who's who and what's what, and, you know, and, and they got so much disagreement between all of them as well, so that tells me that, Nobody really knows, or it's been removed for some reason. Okay, uh, let me see. Um, if Joseph was indeed living at least sometime after Jesus turned age 30, then it's entirely possible that he had other children by other wives. I mean, why not? What is evidence that the Gospels concentrated their language on the life of the Messiah and were not intended to commit much to other things outside the direct life of the Messiah? I mean, that's why they were written. They were the Gospels, the good news of our King. All right, we're going to look a little closer at the brothers of Jesus. I mean, this is interesting in the case of history as well. All right, Matthew chapter 13, verses 54 through 56. Matthew 13, 54 through 56. Again, the context of this part of it is to look closer, get a little, as more in-depth understanding of, of the, I believe, the true biological brothers of Jesus. All right, Matthew thirteen fifty four. And when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch as they were astonished, and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? That's, of course, how Jesus was identified as the son of the carpenter. Of course, his father's occupation was carpenter. Is not his mother called Mary? So these, these religious leaders in the synagogue are breaking down the family. And his brethren, James and Joseph, which is Joseph and Simon and Judas or Judah. So here we have the first record of his brethren being, or his brothers, as Eldaphos in in the Greek, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas. Remember, it's calling them his brothers. And verse 56, and his sisters. Are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? Um, and, of course, the speech of the religious leaders, uh, it, 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 what it was doing was there to kind of bring um, a comparative example between, you know, who is this man? Who is this Jesus? We know his whole family. We know who they are. They're nothing great. They're just your everyday people. So, you know, and they're trying to uh, gauge who this man they have teaching with all this wisdom, how could he possibly learn this and gain this being the son of a carpenter and with basically more than probably uneducated siblings because they knew of the whole family. You know, that was that region, the synagogue in their city or Nazareth or Galilee, somewhere in there. Mark chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. Mark 6, 3 and 4. Okay, again, this is another uh, instance of this. And it says, "Is not this the carpenter? This, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, and Joseph, and of Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us?" And they were offended at him. Now, this is the example, the only time where Jesus is actually referenced as being his occupation carpenter. So he actually took after his father. All right, and they were offended, probably family business, whatever the thing, and they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. And Acts chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Again, Acts 1, 12 through 14. Then, then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from a Sabbath, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into the upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James. 
and verse 14, these all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Again, making the distinction, first we're talking about um, uh, the writer of Acts details for us, uh, the apostles that were there in the upper room, um, you know, both the Jameses were there, and one actually we know is that Peter and James, or James and John, the sons of Zebedee, um, they have their father, so that's already, um, you know, that, that's already a no-brainer that, that James had already had ownership by his father, Zebedee. And then here it says James, the son of Alphaeus. You know, they didn't have to say James, the son of, or the son of Zebedee, because they had to put James and John together. You already know from the Gospels that who their father was. But the other James, they gave him the name Alphaeus, and this James, you know, if we can figure out who James is, it means a whole lot in context of <clears throat> establishing the timeline for when these brothers, biological brothers of Jesus, came into the picture. And again, on verse 14, excuse me, um, that it says, with his brethren, meaning that ownership of who these brothers were, and the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren, not the mother of Jesus and her other sons. So again, it makes a distinction, but it still implies ownership being in the same family. All right. Uh, I got in parentheses here. If it would have meant, and the brethren, if it would have been anybody else besides other, if it would have been related by uh, spiritual brothers, or what it should have been written, and with the brothers, with the brethren, not his brethren. Again, there's a big distinction in the way the word is written. All right, this is from, I'm going to give you some uh, quotes from um, this dude. Uh, he was actually, um, you know, connected with the Catholic Church to a degree. I think he had an underlying motive, as they all did, but his name was Epiphanius. He, he wrote something called, there's a three-book volume called the Panarian of Epiphanius, and he was of the place called Salamis. Well, maybe some of you all heard this, this guy. This is really the first time that I've got him on my computer, some of the books, but I never really looked into him. And um, he, you know, this guy here, uh, let me back up. The word Panarian means against heresy. So what he actually did is this man in his books, Epiphanius, he took and he wrote letters to all these little different groups, these little different sects, and he would attack what he perceived to be their heresies. And he was the one that was trying to be the authoritative voice and actually trying to clear up the history um, for where they failed in their understanding or not so much failed where they had a purpose to rewrite the way things were actually meant to be and other things. But the point is even this man here was argued against. And the reason I'm bringing this up because he brings up um, like he's the definitive source that the history of this hidden Joseph and his family. So this is what he said. In, in This is in book two, and this is a quote. <clears throat> and this letter he's writing to the, this letter of heresy is against the the uh, group of the anti-dicomerians. Anti-dicomerians. I've never heard of them, but that's who the letter is against. It's some sect or some group, some place back. And in fact, this guy, um, his history comes around uh, 3 AD or 300 AD. So he wasn't there immediately after uh, the apostles went out and started, you know, ministering the good news and looking for the, the uh, you know, the dispersed among the Gentiles. He was 200 and some years removed from that, and he's trying to write as an authority. All right. Okay. In this book too, he writes, and Mary Magdalene stood by the cross, and Mary the wife of Cleopas and Mary, the mother of Rufus. Now, in the Gospels, it never mentions, the, it just mentions the, the sister of Mary, and here it's, it's actually calling her the mother of Rufus, and the other Mary and Salome and other women. And it didn't say, <clears throat> excuse me, and this is the guy writing this to, the, to, this, to these people, and he's saying that it didn't say Joseph was there or James, the Lord's brother. Who died, and, and they're saying that James, the Lord's brother, the Messiah's blood kin, died in Virginia at the age of 96. I don't know where the history is about that, but that's what they claim he died at the age of 96. Obviously, right there in itself, the statement 
and that using that historical marker would have to say that James, the brother of Jesus, as we just got done reading in Mark six three and in uh, Matthew wherever it was, that um, you know this is the older brother of Jesus. All right, automatically placing him before Mary came into the picture. All right, you can see what the writing does. No iron implement had touched his head. He had never visited a bathhouse. He had never eaten meat. He did not own a change of clothing, wore only a threadbare linen garment. And this man, Epiphanius, actually argues that um, in, in the Gospel of, oh, geez, where I forgot what it was there. Yeah, the Gospel of Mark, there was, there was the account that um, when Jesus was being led to Pontius Pilate, that uh, a certain young man, they call him a young man in the gospel God actually came out in his linen cloth, you know, wrapped around him, and, and, and then he, he, he cast it around the Messiah, and he took off, fled naked. But the context of the gospel actually calls this the young man. But this guy here in his writing says that he believes that this James, the Lord's brother, as he puts it, or some people know him as James the Just, um, he also says in the same voice that he was the young man that fled and left the cloth where he had clad. So he's given a contradiction. He's, he's actually saying he's the older, much older brother of, of the Messiah, but he's also saying that he was a young man, which would have meant that he was younger than the Messiah going to um, be crucified at age 33 or 33 and a half, if you follow what I'm trying to say. So this guy in himself um, kind of contradicts his own self. Mark, uh, no, okay, that's, Mark chapter 14, verse 51, 52 is where that account is. All right, again, this is another quote from this guy, Epiphanius. Um, this is from book one, and this letter was, this uh, letter against the heresies is directed at the Nazareans, and he, and he writes, Since James, who was called the Lord's brother and who was his apostle, was immediately made the first bishop. He was Joseph's son by birth, but was ranked as the Lord's brother because of their upbringing together. So he was identified in the Gospels, and we already know that we read that. For this James was Joseph's son by, and this is in quotations, his first wife, not by Mary, as I have said in many other places. That's what this guy, he keeps reaffirming that this James, Jesus' brother by Joseph, was from the first wife, which incidentally, her name never comes up any place. I can't find a record of her name anywhere. But again, we find that, <clears throat> man, excuse me again. We find out that um, Jerome, as I talked about earlier, um, he actually believed that, uh, the son, that this James was the son of Mary, the sister of the Messiah. This was actually Mary's blood sisters, so it actually would have been her nephew, James. So there's already an argument here. Jerome believes himself to be an expert. This guy needs, you know, believes himself to be an expert. But, and there's a lot of other disparaging, um, you know, uh, contradictions about how this James, and he was the primary focus because he was um, really evident. He, he had established a, a quite a headship amongst the apostles, uh, as we can see in the letters and such. But um, you know, there's already trying to place him all over the place. Uh, let me see. This is back to book two, anti -comer to the anti Um again from Epiphanius. And it says, Joseph begot James when he was somewhere around 40 years old. After him, he had a son named Joseph, then Simeon, after him, then Judah. And this guy actually says two daughters, one named Mary and one Salome, and his wife died. And many years later, as a widow of over 80, he took Mary. So this guy is saying that Joseph had um, his first child, his firstborn, James. And then he had the other three sons and two more daughters in the span of 40 years. And then, um, so that means that according to what he's writing, when Mary, or when, when, when Joseph, Mary was a spouse of Joseph when she gave birth to Jesus, that Joseph was apparently, according to this guy, in his early 80s. So what, what's the deal behind this? Well, the, the fact of the matter is, this is a push by the Catholic Church again to substantiate that Joseph had all these children 
before Mary came on the scene to completely make her a perpetual virgin for history so they can honor and venerate her as some, you know, above Yah himself. And, and if you go back and look at this guy, he was connected to the Catholic Church. In fact, he went um, to the, the, the treaty at Constantinople with the, Catholic, with the Roman Catholic heads, and he had a whole bunch of other interactions with these people. Okay, his last quote again is from Book 2, um, talking to the same people. For it was plain that in comparison with the years of the Lord's incarnation, James was the elder. The scripture calls them brothers to compound. The scripture calls them brothers to confound our opponents and names them James, Joseph, Simeon, Judah, Salome, and Mary, so that they will learn whose son James is and, what, and by which mother and understand who the elder is. So, in here, he's almost kind of contradicting himself again. He's saying that there, there's a concerted effort to actually call them. Um, they were written as brothers to confound other people. In one, one sentence, he's saying that these are the brothers of, of Jesus, the sons of Joseph. And here he's trying to say that they were put in, in, and they were expressed that way and presented that way um, to confound other people. I don't know what sense trying to remove the ability to say that, um, you know, that uh, that these all these all these brothers came after the birth of Jesus. But if you get into the stuff, it, it is so um, really messy. I mean, it really, there's, there's, I do, I pour over a lot of stuff and it's like everybody's flip flopping and inserting and interpreting and doing all kinds of stuff. But um, let's get finished, get on with this. Anyway, if you want, if you want to unload, if you want to, it's free download PDF on this uh, Panarine of Epiphanius of Salmus. You can get all three of his books just over, Google it. All right, the mystery of James the Less. Well, this is an important figure uh, in this whole thing, too. This James keeps coming up all over the place. All right, Mark chapter 15, verses 39 and 40. Mark 13, 49, 39 and 40. All right, and when the centurion who stood by near him saw that he cried out in this manner and passed away, he said, truly this was the son of Yah. There were also women, women looking af- on afar off. So we have this picture of you know, my, Yahshua up here. On, he had just died, and the centurion you know, makes this statement, and then we have these women looking on afar off. They were distant. You know, they, were, they were out of ways actually watching all this. Among whom was Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the Less and of Joseph and of Salome. Well, we already know that Jesus had biological brothers. One was named James and one was named Joseph. Okay? We already know that. Salome, in this instance, it's never proven that it's actually the sister of Jesus. It actually, you can prove that it actually is the wife of Zebedee, the mother of James and, and John. All right. And the word, um, the word less, because they use a definitive term here. This is the only time it's used to describe this James. They call him James the Less. And there's, there has to be, he's written like that, so we take notice of why he's actually distinguished as James the Less. All right, the word less in the Greek is the 3398. And it, it, it's uh, mikros in, in the Greek. It means small, little, of size, hence of stature or length, of space, Big one, of age, less by birth, or younger, talking about in age, of time, short, brief, little while, how little, of quantity, number, amount, rank, influence. Now, there has been through the centuries a fairly common consensus that James, the son of Alphaeus, is also James the Less, the son of Mary. That that would mean that Alphaeus and Mary our um, husband and wife. But unfortunately, there is absolutely no way to arrive at this conclusion based on the accounts of the Gospels, even when attempting to tie James to Alphaeus through James' mother Mary. You can't do it. It's not there. History and the historians have tried to do it, but they can't even do it. And I say unfortunate because if James, the son of Alphaeus, 
was officially known as James the Less, the son of Alphaeus, it would have helped immensely in clearing up any confusion or misinterpretation of the gospel accounts of exactly who was the father of James the Less, who, who he is, who he was. We do know that James, the son of Alphaeus, had a brother called Levi, as this fact is written in the Gospel of Mark. In Mark chapter 2, verse 14, I'll read it quick. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of custom and said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. So we do know biblically that um, James had a brother named Levi. Again, there's no connection to James the Less as Alphaeus being his father. All right. So when you look at James the Less as James the Younger or James uh, Less of Age by birth, it, it, it shows a whole different context. Now, some of the, again, the church commentators, the church writers always try to portray James the Less as James because he was short in height. And that, that's the whole meaning that they try to, they actually try to say that that was the whole purpose behind it, using the Greek 3398 Mikros, defining him because he was a little man. But if you go compare him um, to Zacharias, um, it doesn't ever say, it doesn't use the same Greek word to define and give us the picture of his stature's height. Was, wasn't his, who was it, the one that was up in the tree? That's the one I'm thinking about. Was that correct? Okay, anyway. All right, let me see. Uh, da, da, da. And again, this verse included with the whole picture helps even the more so to distance the eye that James with the less was the son of Alphaeus and the brother of Levi. For the one account where James, there were this James is written of as James the less, his brother is written as being Joseph or Joseph, and there is no mention at all of James the less being ever connected to Levi. We need to ask ourselves, I mean, that's what I'm talking about. When I married the mother of James the less and Joseph, it didn't say marry the mother of James the less, Joseph, and Levi. Okay, so they're never lumped together. It was naming all of her sons, but all of a sudden it leaves out Levi. We need to ask ourselves why in this one instance where James is labeled as less, quote less, was it felt necessary by the author of the book of Mark to make this known? He had to make a distinction. It was most certainly written that way so distinctions could be made from the other James, preferably the two apostles, of which also went by the name of James. You know, I still personally believe that the James that was that the James that was the biological brother to Yahshua was the younger was younger than the Messiah, thus very possibly identifying him as James the little one, or James the younger, or James the um, you know the smaller brother. Separating, separating for us the two apostles, which by which went, which went by the name of James, for they certainly would have been adults. And I'm talking about. We'll, we'll read about that too. We also know that a certain Judas, who it appears had the proper name of Thaddeus, Labaius, Judas. If you look at Matthew chapter 10 verses 3 and Luke 6:16 6, and Acts 1:13, was also a brother to James, the son of Alphaeus. So James, the son of Alphaeus, not only had a brother Levi, he also had a brother Judas as well. That actually can be connected. The Messiah had a brother named James and a brother named Judas, but these two brothers were the sons of Joseph and not the sons of Alphaeus. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, he seemingly identifies a certain James only as the master's brother and also as an apostle. We can ascertain quite clearly from the Gospels that James, the biological brother to Jesus had not yet been ordained as an apostle. And this James in the Galatians 1, that was in the gospel accounts. And by the time he got to the book of uh, uh, when Paul wrote this letter to the Galatians, he had been, he had actually established himself as a leader in the, in the assembly. And this James in Galatians 1, 19 cannot be the son of Zebedee for Acts 12, 2, we read that Herod, had James, the brother of John, both the sons of Zebedee, put to death with a sword. Could the James of 119 be the other James, Apostle James? Possibly. But again, the context and the way in which it is written, or at least translated, makes it look more like that James is indeed the Messiah's blood brother. 
And we're going to read that, Galatians 1, verse 18 and 19. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. But other the apostles saw I none, save James, the Messiah's brother. So why didn't, we already know that um, this has to be the James, the Messiah's biological brother, because if James, the brother, the son of Zebedee, had been killed, then the other James, we already know, was the son of Alphaeus, who was not the Messiah's um, earthly father. So you can see right there, it only comes down to James being that James, which was actually the Messiah's brother. Um, Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And this James, this records the death of James, the brother of John. So again, we're, we're breaking apart, trying to figure out which James is who and who he belongs to and who his father is um, and his 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 uh, ranking in the structure here and, and in the context of what we can you know get by reading of the gospel accounts and some of the stuff in Acts and letters. All right, so Acts chapter one verses. Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, I'm sorry. 12, 1 and 2. Now about that time here, the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the assembly, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. So this already eliminates John, that James automatically from Galatians 1, 19, James. He's already gone. All right. So what does all this really mean? It helps greatly in providing some evidence that neither one of the two James written of as the disciples of Christ could be the James the less, the son of Mary, and therefore lends to the possibility that James the less, or James the little one, or James the younger, as is the title James the less, it means the little one or the younger, was possibly a son of Joseph, which would then make Mary the mother of James the less, also the wife of Joseph. If it's there, if it's and it is possible. Matthew chapter twenty-seven verses fifty-four through fifty-six. Matthew twenty-seven fifty-four through fifty-six. Ooh, we just about done, I think. A few more pages. Let me see. Oh my goodness, I'm not going to make it. Ooh, I'm kind of dragging, but I'm trying to speed this up. I didn't know it was that late. All right. Um, now, when the centurion and they were with him watching, you saw the earthquake, and those things that were done, they feared greatly. Truly, this was the son of Yah. And many women were be there beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him. Among them, which was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's children. Now, there stood, okay, and then going to John chapter 19, verse 25. So we're getting this, this idea of all these Marys standing there um, and, and whose children they were or whose mothers, what, what, what children were theirs, because they're named in these accounts. Uh, John 19.25, Now there stood by the cross of Yahshua, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. And remember that in Epiphanius' account, he says his mother's sister was actually um, Mary, the mother. So we have like four Marys standing around, you know, the stake. It's just, everybody was named Mary. Um, I'm not going to make it. I'm going to kind of... Man, I still got four or five pages. Shoot, I wish I would have picked up because this is really the stuff that helped bring some of this out. And what I'm going to have to do is just conclude it on my next blog talk. But um, what it does do, I'll give you a brief overview before I lose you all. Um, ooh, I got a few minutes. Is that if you go back and study Cleophas, um, C-L-E-O-P-H-A-S in one writing and in another area, it's C-L-E-O-P-A-S. Now, if you look behind him, there's an attempt to connect both these Cleophases and also make him, a.k.a. Alphaeus, the son of James. And there's, and there's a concerted effort to tie Cleophas as the husband to Mary, the mother of James the less. But again, it's impossible. You can't make that connection. And these Cleophases that are mentioned twice in the Gospels are actually by two different Greek names and mean two different things. But yet... The Christian writers tie these two together, again, to promote an agenda that doesn't exist. Um, I wish I had time to read all this stuff. Because certain people die um, but during that time, which eliminates them from actually being the father of this James and that James. And, um, you know, it, it's, 
just unbelievable all the stuff that it takes just to even weed through all this. But anyway, I'm going to close with that. I went a little bit talking about his sisters, which there's not a whole bunch written about. Just the fact that um, you, it's impossible to say that Jesus had the four men, the four brothers mentioned, James, Joseph, Judah, and Simon were actually cousins. And but then they can never explain the next verse where it said, "And these are his sisters." They, they've never done that. They always exclude that. They just concentrate on the brothers, and they kind of like just slip out of the side. The, the sister part. Anyway, I sure hope you all enjoyed that. Uh, this blog talk. I know it was a lot in here. You know, again, purely, this is purely um, an educated guess. You know, proof positive that Joseph had two wives at the same time, but there is absolute proof that he had two wives. So, um, what much time we got? Am I still on the air? Ooh, we got about well, 45 seconds. So, anyway, um, I sure hope that this is edifying. Hey, and somebody can build on this and by the information that is available and maybe there's something I still honestly believe that there's something there that would substantiate this is actually um, uh, a fact but um, is it a possibility absolutely I, I, I truly believe that um, with all my heart and it's just a concerted effort by the, the establishment to um, ruin the idea of polygyny and making a purely monogamous society anyway uh, you bless y'all hey y'all have a good week be encouraged. Keep Pastor Dow up in prayer. As you can see, that the battle's coming hot and heavy. Shalom, bless y'all. Uh oh, look at him looking. <laughs>